Welcome to Beat Diabetes. I'm Dennis Pollock, and today we're going to look at a new kid on the block, Dr. Andrew Kutnick. No, he's not really a kid. He is a, well, he's called doctor. He has a PhD in biomedical research, I believe. He's not a medical doctor, but he is a researcher, and he is fascinated, and you might say almost obsessed, with uh, researching metabolic issues and how to manage diabetes, beat diabetes, reverse diabetes, whatever you want to say. Dr. Kutnick, in a way, reminds me partly of Dr. Richard Bernstein and partly of Dr. Ben Bickman. Dr. Ben Bickman is also a medical researcher, uh, not a medical doctor, and uh, he is also fascinated with uh, the metabolic syndrome that so many people are facing these days. So in that way, Dr. Kutnick is like Dr. Bickman, but in another way, he's like Dr. Bernstein because like Dr. Richard Bernstein, the late Dr. Bernstein, uh, Dr. Kutnick is a type 1 diabetic himself, and he desperately needed uh, some answers and found them and went to a low-carbohydrate diet and shocked his doctor. This is fascinating to me. His doctor, as it turns out, was at that time the president of the ADA, the American Diabetes Association. And when his doctor checked his A1C and found out he was a type 1 diabetic with a 5.5 A1C, his doctor was just flabbergasted and asked him, what in the world are you doing? And he told him he was eating a low-carb diet. Well, you know, the ADA is not exactly known for enthusiastically promoting a low-carb diet. They finally got around to suggesting that, yeah, it may be of some help, but you get the feeling even that was grudging. Uh, but in this case, his doctor was uh, excited and actually asked him to speak to his medical students. So Dr. Kutnick, interesting guy, very well-spoken, very articulate. Seems like a nice guy and uh, has some good things to say about how to deal with uh, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, and all the terrible things that come along with it. But his big fascination these days seems to be how it, uh, metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance relate to cardiovascular disease, heart attacks, uh, how, how they link so closely together. Normally, you think of them as two different things. You know, somebody dies of a heart attack, somebody else dies of diabetic complications. Never the two shall meet, but that's not true. And uh, he shows that again and again through some of the research he's done. He, he did a 10-year case study on a type 1 diabetic where he switched on a dime, this particular diabetic did, from the American Diabetes Association, which kind of promotes, or at least at that time did, promoted a higher carb but natural carb diet. So you eat sweet potatoes and you eat brown rice and quinoa, uh, but you make sure and eat a lot of uh, plant foods and uh, high carb foods even. So this guy was following the ADA diet and uh, they convinced him to switch to a keto diet and then they watched him for 10 years and their big goal was to see how is this going to affect his likelihood of cardiovascular problems? Or will it cause him cardiovascular problems? Kind of amazing. They could find someone willing to, to uh, risk his life and, uh, uh, on, on a keto diet, but they did. So anyway, the guy turned out to do very well on this keto diet. And after 10 years, and, and they monitor, monitored this guy extensively. They he had him on a CGM. They could see where his glucose levels were. They checked his ketones to make sure he was really doing keto. Uh, they checked his uh, bone density, and they checked his liver, and they checked his uh, triglycerides, all kinds of things. They just kept track of everything. And at the end of 10 years, and, and they, they especially looked at uh, heart issues, and how flexible was the lining of the heart, how, how soft and how fluid was it. And uh, at the end of 10 years, he was doing great and uh, had a calcium score of zero, so no blockage at all, no signs he was ever going to be headed for cardiac, uh, cardiovascular disease or uh, a heart attack, a heart event of any kind. So that just confirmed what Dr. Kutnick had found out for himself. 
And he makes a bunch of statements on some of his interviews. I mean, he's kind of the latest, greatest interviewee among all the keto people. And there's a bunch of folks that have interviewed him. If you type in his name, Dr. Andrew Kutnick, uh, you'll find him all over YouTube being interviewed. And I think he may have his own channel. I'm not sure. So I just wanted to share a few of the statements he made. We may get into his life a little bit more, a little bit more extensively later uh, on another episode. But just a few of his statements. Uh, and, and one of the things that fascinated me as he was talking in uh, one of his interviews was this. He talked about the problem and he used two words. Well, I guess three. Elevated and variable glucose levels. Okay, maybe four words. But elevated and variable. He's, if he said it once, he must have said it six, seven times. The problem with elevated and variable. Well, let's break down those two words. Elevated means it's high. So we're not talking about glucose around 120 uh, for a peak after your meal. We're talking about glucose around 200, 250, 300, elevated. And then he uses the word variable which means it's jumping up and down. It's bouncing all over the place. It's not stable. And that's the ultimate problem uh, as far as he's concerned and as far as I'm concerned uh, that leads to so many health issues, heart attacks and strokes and kidney failure, elevated high glucose and variable bouncing around quite a bit. Uh, that, that's the problem. He uses that term a lot. He talks about a 30-year trial that he didn't do himself, but uh, wasn't involved with himself, but, but he, he knows of it. He studied it. He had a thousand uh, patients, type 1 diabetics over 30 years. He's fascinated with type 1 diabetes particular, particularly, but he is also very much aware and, and proclaims that essentially the same issues that type 1s face, type 2s face in terms of the outcome of elevated and variable glucose. No, type 1s and types 2s are, are different for sure, but still, they can both have elevated glucose. They can still have variable bouncing up and down glucose, and they can still have problems. So this trial of, uh, and, and this was one of the most fascinating things to me, this trial of 1,000 patients over 30 years, he says, indicates that, uh, and they divided them into two groups. So one of the groups, they gave more insulin, and they were able to control the glucose levels a little better. And the other group, they just left them as they were. They had higher glucose levels, but they took less insulin. Now, a lot of times, keto folks say the whole problem is insulin. They will never admit that glucose levels, high glucose levels are a problem at all. But this sure indicates otherwise, that high glucose all by itself without the insulin factor is still a major problem. And so those who had the higher insulin, but the lower glucose did better, they had improvements in their cardiovascular risk far more than those who just didn't take as much, in much insulin and they let their glucose run wild. Uh, glucose control, in other words, is a big, big factor in cardiovascular events and your likelihood. The question most of us want to know that have not had a heart attack is, how can I prevent one and am I headed for one? And the answer seems to be, and this is what this Dr. Andrew Kutnick talks about all the time. And by the way, type his name in the YouTube search box. You'll find him all over the place. But the answer seems to be, if you can tame the glucose spikes and keep your glucose levels at a reasonable place, you are going to diminish your chances of a heart attack and a stroke, by the way, uh, tremendously. He makes the uh, statement that for a type 1 diabetics, they're like very likely to have a reduced lifespan from 10 to 18 years. If they get type 1 diabetes as a child, which most do, most likely they'll never make it to 80. They'll be doing good if they make it to 70. Probably they'll average dying in the 60s somewhere. Type 2 diabetics likewise are more likely 
to die sooner, although not as, they, they're not as bad as the type 1s. But he says the risk of heart events, heart attacks, increase from six times to 14 times in type 2 diabetics. So in other words, if you're a type 2 and your buddy is not, you're at a minimum of six times more likely to have a heart attack than he is. Maybe even up to 14 times as likely to have a heart attack. Now, this is a big deal. And one of the reasons it's a big deal is a lot of people, they never think of high glucose as being a risk factor for heart attacks. It's like, well, you, you may end up having to pee more often and you may, up, you may end up with bad eyesight. You may end up with some other things. But heart attack, that's in a whole different camp. It's not in a different camp, my friend. Diabetes and heart failure and heart attacks and strokes, they're all linked together very tightly. And they, they did a study in one, the American Diabetes Journal of the risk factors for having a heart attack. The number one risk factor, the number one thing that pointed out that you, sir, or you, ma'am, are likely to have a heart attack, is your A1C. High A1C, high likelihood of a heart attack. Lower A1C, not much likelihood of a heart attack. That was number one. Now you may say, okay, that's number one, but I'll bet you number two was cholesterol or number two was LDL cholesterol. Nope, not even close. I think number two was age and they had triglycerides and they had all kinds of things that were ahead of Cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol was number 10. It was not nearly such a likely predictor of a heart attack as high glucose, high and variable glucose, bouncing up and down day after day, up and down day after day, year after year, up and down, high, variable, spiking and plummeting glucose is the number one factor that says you're headed for a heart attack. Number one, above everything, even above age. So in other words, a 55-year-old with spiking glucose and high glucose is more likely to have a heart attack than an 85-year-old who's got stable glucose. So let me just say this. Your blood sugar was made to be stable. No, not rock steady. It's not like you're going to spend all your life at 90 milligrams per deciliter. It's going to rise and fall, but within a very limited space, somewhere around 75 milligrams per deciliter at the lowest, up to about 125, 130 milligrams per deciliter at the highest. That's the way it's supposed to be. Very steady, very stable, Moving up gently, moving down gently, moving up gently after another meal, moving down gently. That's the way you are made. And instead, we've got people jumping up to 300 milligrams per deciliter and plummeting down to 50. And type 1s especially have the, the low glucose. If you're type 2, you may not have too much low glucose, but you'll sure have high. And you'll also be doing some bouncing. He says what we found in the particular individual they studied for 10 years is the ketogenic diet not only had better vascular measurements, heart measurements, not only did it do better than uh, for normal type 1 diabetics when we had this guy switch over to a keto diet, he says in many cases, this individual that they did the case study on actually had better cardiovascular physiology than people that did not have type 1 diabetes. And it translates to type 2 as well. Not all that much difference in terms of outcome. Yeah, I know there's a difference between a type 1 and a type 2 for sure. And a type 1's pancreas doesn't make any insulin, a type 2 does, and type 1 uh, it has a lot of issues the type 2 doesn't have to deal with. But believe me, the outcome 
if a type 2 dies at 61 years old from diabetic complications or from a diabetically caused heart attack and a type 1 dies at the same age from a diabetically caused heart attack, then you're not going to find on their gravestone where it says, well, this one had a heart attack due to type 1 and this one had a heart attack due to type 2. So what he is finding uh, through his research and his studies in this particular case study that he did is something that we've actually known for quite some time, but it's just confirming it, confirming it, confirming it. Here's one more voice speaking out, Dr. Andrew Kutnick. One more voice, very articulate voice, and I have a feeling he's going to be speaking to Americans and people from all over the world on this issue for a good long while. Type 1 diabetic who is very well controlled, eats a very low carbohydrate diet, and he's convinced that high glucose that's both elevated and variable is really bad news. The answer, of course, is to eat the low carbohydrate diet. Eat maybe 30 grams of carbs or less per day and enjoy some carnivore meals here and there. Don't have to be totally carnivore. I call it ketovore. But uh, just don't pig out on the carbs. Get that blood sugar stable. I hope that this Beat Diabetes video has been a blessing to you. We're thrilled with every victory report about diabetes that we receive, but keep in mind that our primary ministry is teaching God's Word and lifting up the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. We recently sponsored a mission in Kakamega, Kenya. As usual, the centerpiece of this mission was our Jesus Conference, which features 20 videos created by Benedict and me, aimed at pastors, teachers, evangelists, and church leaders and focused on sharing the gospel of Jesus and abiding in him personally. At the end of the conference, we award certificates for all who attend. This is more than just teaching, however. These four-day conferences are an event. We pay for meals for the participants, and we have breaks for tea and fellowship. We set aside discussion times after each study, where the attendees can ask questions and share insights they've gained. We also provide a free medical clinic for the area, which the Africans really appreciate. Many of them do not have access to doctors and clinics, and in some cases, they just can't afford medical help, even if there were a doctor nearby. And finally, we provide food for the local widows, who often do not have the job skills to get any kind of real work and struggle with hunger and lack constantly. It is your generosity that makes these conferences and outreaches possible. Please consider making a generous donation to Spirit of Grace Ministries. See the link in the description.